The final version of Exposure by Wilfred Owen was written in September 1918. This was less than two months before the poet's death during the crossing of a canal near the village of Joncourt in northern France on the 4th of November, just one week before the armistice which brought about the end of the First World War. The poem was published posthumously in 1920 in the collection Poems, edited by Owen's friend and fellow war poet, Siegfried Sassoon. Owen's poetry shows a different side to the war than that produced by his contemporaries. Here we do not find the idealistic patriotism of Rupert Brooke, the pithy and angry satire of Siegfried Sassoon, nor the jingoistic propaganda of Jesse Pope. Instead, Owen, in an unfinished preface for his first collection of poems, describes his work as not about heroes. English poetry is not yet fit to speak of them. Nor is it about deeds or lands, nor anything about glory, honour, dominion or power, except war. Above all, this book is not concerned with poetry. The subject of it is war, and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. This pity is not limited to the pain and anguish that he felt at the suffering he both experienced and witnessed. Owen saw this as a tragedy of universal pain. He deplored the fact that we are compelled to repeatedly commit acts of violence and evil against ourselves at the expense of ourselves. The event the poem describes happened in the winter of 1917, when Owen and his men lay in freezing conditions on a snowy ridge for several days and nights, unable to move or change out of their wet, frozen clothing. He was to write of this experience. We were marooned in a frozen desert. There was not a sign of life on the horizon and a thousand signs of death. The marvel is we did not all die of the cold. The poet, W.B. Yeats, whom Owen held in high regard, was not a fan of his work, disdainfully commenting that passive suffering is not a theme for poetry. The men are indeed passive throughout. They watch, drowse and cringe in holes. Yet they are fighting an invisible enemy, the extreme cold and the symptoms of encroaching hypothermia. They may not be galloping heroically across the battlefield or be engaging in skirmishes with the Germans, yet the passive suffering which Owen so eloquently describes in exposure does much to evoke the pity of man's inhumanity to man and the needless waste of this lost generation. The poem comprises eight stanzas of five lines each. Lines are long and irregular, varying between 12 and 15 syllables in the first four lines of each stanza, which enhances the sense of the soldier's seemingly interminable weight in the snow. The fifth line of each stanza is noticeably shorter, at either five syllables or seven syllables. Each stanza has an A, B, B, A, C rhyme scheme, which employs slant rhyme and pararhyme. Whilst the similarities in the consonant sounds give the poem a sense of cohesion, the change in vowel sound is discordant and jarring and gives the poem an uneasy feel. The shorter fifth line hangs anticlimactically at the end of each stanza to give a sense of the way in which the men are kept in a state of heightened anxiety, which is never relieved, either by help coming to them or by engagement in battle. The poem also does not have a regular metrical structure. It is given a rhythmic quality instead by the dense interweaving of alliteration, sibilance, consonance and assonance. Most lines are end-stopped, which helps to add to the feeling of stasis experienced by the men. The refrain, but nothing happens, 
is repeated four times and highlights Owen's theme that war is not all about fighting. A lot of it is about waiting, which can be just as tough, both mentally and physically. The circularity of the poem's structure enhances this idea. The men are in exactly the same state of limbo at the end as they are at the beginning. Owen uses the present tense throughout, which gives the poem a sense of immediacy and rawness. The repetition of the pronouns we and our throughout communicate his experience of collective endurance and suffering. Owen alludes to literature, popular culture and the Bible to enhance the communication of how his experiences of war have shaped his understanding of it and belief in it. The poet also creates synesthesia throughout, which is where language relating to different senses is mixed. This helps to evoke the confusion of the senses the men must have been feeling as hypothermia began to take a grip on their bodies. The title Exposure refers on a superficial level to the way in which the men are suffering the ill effects of exposure to the bitterly cold weather, such as incipient hypothermia. Indeed, the men all show symptoms, such as confusion, hallucination and terminal burrowing, which is where sufferers try to hide themselves away in small enclosed spaces. Exposure can, however, also mean the revelation of secret and damaging information. In this case, the exposure of the traditional view of war, that it was poetic and noble as a lie. The first stanza begins, Our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that nive us. The verb ache suggests a continuous dull pain, but the use of brain rather than head would indicate that this discomfort may go beyond the physical to both the psychological and the spiritual, such as shell shock and emotional and spiritual fatigue. He personifies these winds with the verb nivus. The hard, consonant sounds here help to evoke the violent intent with which the winds appear to stab at them with their bayonets. And the image sets the idea up early on that the elements are just as much their enemy as the Germans. Note the way in which Owen interweaves sibilants and hard consonant sounds to evoke the hissing of the wind. This line was inspired by the first line of romantic poet John Keats's poem, Ode to a Nightingale. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, which describes the poet's dreamlike state in between wakefulness and sleep. The men are also trapped in this halfway state. Wearied, we keep awake because the night is silent. Even though the men are wearied, they are unable to sleep due to the silence. Usually silence is conducive to sleep, but they are on their guard, suspicious of what the enemy might be up to. Low, drooping flares confuse our memory of the salient. The men are hunkering down on a salient, which was an area of land that projected or bulged into territory held by the opposing army. They are thus in an extremely vulnerable position as they are surrounded on three sides by the enemy. Light flares were a defence tactic used at night in order to detect any reconnaissance patrols crawling across no man's land on their stomachs sent out by the opposing army to find out what the enemy were up to. The men seem to be disoriented by the light from these low, drooping flares, which is confusing them about their already vulnerable position and sets up a nightmarish vision of their surroundings. One false step, and they could find themselves in enemy territory. In line four, the use of a Cinderton Curious, nervous, evokes the jittery tension of the sentries as they whisper to one another, worried by silence. 
Three of the five lines in this stanza end with an ellipsis, which, as well as creating tension, evokes the idea of their seemingly endless wait for something to happen. The stanza ends anticlimactically, however, with the refrain, but nothing happens. In the first line of the second stanza, Owen introduces the idea of synesthesia, watching we hear, to evoke the way in which the men's senses are becoming confused. He also personifies the wind once more. Watching, we hear the mad gusts tugging on the wire, like twitching agonies of men among its brambles. The adjective mad adds to the poet's nightmarish vision of seemingly demented elements which are intent on attacking them. The simile, like twitching agonies of men among its brambles, alludes to the barbed wire which was ubiquitous on the battlefields of the First World War and evokes an image of the men, perhaps in their death rows, entangled among their unforgiving spikes. This suffering is taking place against a backdrop of gunfire as Owen builds on the soundscape. Northward, incessantly, the flickering gunnery rumbles far off, like a dull rumour of some other war. They are removed from the action which incessantly or relentlessly continues far off. The simile, like a dull rumour of some other war, enhances the sense of emotional as well as physical disconnection between the men and the war in which they are fighting, as it seems as unreal to them as mere gossip or tittle-tattle. This image echoes lines from Matthew chapter 24, verse 6 in the New Testament, where Jesus said, You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. The end referred to here is the end times, or the last judgment. Jesus is basically saying that wars are inevitable, and that their occurrence does not mean that the end times are imminent. This is perhaps an allusion to Owen's belief that war is an inevitable and perpetual part of the human condition, and that it does not bring about resolution. It also alludes to the idea of waiting, or not yet, which pervades the poem. The idea of the men's spiritual disconnection from the war in which they are engaged is further explored in the rhetorical question which ends the stanza, the very mundanity of which makes it, paradoxically, all the more powerful. What are we doing here? This could be read as Owen's trying to make sense of the immediate position in which he and his men find themselves, alone, vulnerable and exposed in a snowy wasteland and removed from the fighting. That they are there for. But it could, however, also be interpreted as Owen communicating his frustration and despair at the human waste that this war has brought while those conducting it back in England might relieve us and will not. The night has slowly come to an end, but this brings the men no relief. The dawn, which is usually a symbol of light, hope and renewal brings poignant misery as it reaffirms the only three certainties that the men have left that war lasts rain soaks and the clouds sag stormy note the sibilance here which helps to enhance the sense of both the weight of the clouds filled with rain and snow and owen and his men's morale owen imagines the natural world as being against them its elements orchestrated by the personified Dawn, who, as some kind of enemy military leader, is massing in the east her melancholy army of storm clouds, which attacks once more in ranks on shivering ranks of grey. The use of consonant M sounds, as well as the one of only two instances of enchantment, and the repetition of ranks on shivering ranks, enhances the sheer volume and weight of the clouds. Owen appears to conflate the storm clouds with the ranks of Germans 
who wore field grey uniforms and who also lay to the east. His use of the adjective shivering to describe them also suggests that his ire is not so much directed at the enemy troops they are fighting, who it can be imagined are suffering just as much as they, as at those who are in charge. Once more, the stanza ends on the anticlimactic refrain, but nothing happens. Even sudden successive flights of bullets which streak the silence fail to scare the men, and they are dismissed after this first line as they are perceived as less deadly than the air that shudders black with snow. Note Owen's use of sibilance here, which evokes the hissing sound of the bullets as they whiz past, and the synesthesia where the silence, related to the sense of hearing, is streaked, related to the sense of sight, by the bullets. Owen devotes the rest of the stanza to the snow, which is the much more immediate danger. The verb shudders has connotations not only of jerky, weighty movements, but also of fear and disgust. The use of the adjective black to describe the snow perhaps alludes to the darkness of the storm clouds, although it also hints at its malign presence and intent. The snow falls with sidelong flowing flakes that flock, pause and renew. Note the alliteration of the fl sounds which evokes the insidious softness of the snow that comes in waves as the gusts of wind carry it horizontally towards the men. All they can do is watch the flakes wandering up and down the wind's nonchalance. The indifference or lack of concern which the poet perceives in the wind contrasts with the men's continuous anxious state. The snow continues to fall as pale flakes with fingering stealth come feeling for our faces. Note the personification and the alliteration of the th sounds once more as the snow seems to furtively and maliciously seek out the men's faces. The men cringe in holes, cowering like animals, and drift off, either into daydreams or hallucinations, as they stare snow-dazed deep into grassier ditches. These grassier ditches are those back home in an idealised rural England, as the men drowse sun-dozed in an English spring. Instead of snowflakes covering them, they are now littered with blossoms, the snowflakes transformed into white blossom falling from a tree, where, rather than a black storm cloud, the blackbird fusses instead. The stanza ends on another rhetorical question. Is it that we are dying? The confusion of the men here is clear. Are they dreaming, hallucinating, or have they caught a glimpse of heaven? Owen continues with death imagery as he opens the sixth stanza with Slowly Our Ghosts Drag Home. Note the use of the long O sounds here, which enhances the heavy weight of the men's ghosts or spirits as they dream of home. They glimpse the sunk fires, glozed with crusted dark red jewels. This image is probably an allusion to a popular British patriotic First World War song by Ivan Novello, with the lyrics, Keep the home fires burning while your hearts are yearning. Though our lads are far away, they dream of home. Rather than burning, however, the home fires have sunk low as they have been left untended, those at home seemingly indifferent to the anguish and suffering of the troops as the war drags interminably on. There are no flames, only the glowing coals, as the fires are glozed with crusted dark red jewels. Jewels usually signify beauty, but these are crusted and provide no comfort. Crusted dark red also has connotations of dried blood, and so perhaps alludes to the bloodshed of battle. The house is empty, aside from the crickets who jingle there, and the innocent mice who rejoice for hours. 
The shutters and doors are all closed. Although Owen qualifies this with, on us the doors are closed, to indicate that the men are unable to return home and that their fate is sealed. The seventh stanza is probably the hardest one to understand as the development of Owen's ideas takes a more abstract turn. He returns to the image of the fire from the sixth stanza to ruminate on the reason why they are there. Since we believe not otherwise can kind fires burn, now ever suns smile true on child or field or fruit. There is a sense that the we in this we believe, no longer relates to himself and his men, but to the collective consciousness of Great Britain as a whole, which accepts the belief that war is the only way to enable kind fires, or fires in a peaceful land which is not under the dominion of enemy powers, to burn, and for sons to smile true on child or field or fruit, so that the next generation can live and prosper. The men appear as Christ figures for Owen as they are suffering for others. This is the sacrifice that they have to make for a better world. They can do nothing else as there is fear that God's invincible spring is not inevitable after all. Therefore not loath or reluctant we lie out here. This is what they were born for. The final line of the stanza is somewhat ambiguous. For love of God seems dying. Does he mean love for God, which would suggest that people are losing their religious faith? Or does it mean God's love, which would suggest that he feels that it is God who is turning away from humanity? The final stanza returns to the snowy ridge as night falls again. For Owen, God is the controller of the cruel elements, as it is his frost that will fasten on this mud and us, shriveling many hands and puckering foreheads crisp, which would perhaps give more weight to the latter interpretation of the final line of the last stanza. The verbs shriveling and puckering suggest that the cold weather is reducing the men physically as it draws the life out of them. Not only do the men have to suffer their own physical and emotional hardship, But, under the cover of darkness, they also have to bury those who have succumbed to the cold. The burying party, picks and shovels in shaking grasp, pours over half-known faces. Are they shaking because they are shivering or because they are scared? All their eyes are ice. To whose eyes is Owen referring? To the corpses whose eyes are literally ice as they are frozen due to the extreme temperature? Or to the soldiers looking at them because they have become emotionally numb? The poem ends quietly with the refrain, but nothing happens. The pathos of this final line is intense as we realise that the sacrifice these soldiers have made is futile. They haven't died in a battle which has brought about strategic gains. No fire is burning any kinder because of them. They have literally died for nothing. And it is this that is the true pity of war. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.